don't talk about it. Give me a heads up. I was thinking of digging for dirt on some of your famous teammates. So. <laughs> Alright. Who can I stitch up, mate? Who do you want me to stitch up? I'll make a lie up. Save that for later. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the V2 Academy. I'm Chris Latton and joining me today we've got Peter Prickett. Hi, how you doing? Right, we're delighted to be joined online by John Curtis. How are you doing this evening, John? I'm good, thank you. Very good. Uh, how have you been since we last spoke? So, yeah, so, not that busy. It's, um, it's chaotic over here. Yeah, things uh, things are going pretty well. Yeah, it was so, just after um, Christmas we spoke, I think. It was, yeah. yeah a, lot, a lot's happened, lots changed, but, um, but it's all good. Right, so, um, you're, we'll start a little bit of you in the Manchester United Academy. So you're obviously a product of the United Youth System. Um, how were you spotted? My, it's, it's funny because Jeff Watson, who was at the club, I think he ended up being head of recruitment for a very long time, was the, the Midland scout, the West Midland scout. I, I'm from a town called Nuneaton. Yeah. Um, and um, Jeff spotted me playing for my local district team, which was Nuneaton and Bedworth district. It was once you got up to that level, you're just outside, you know, the next level above the school level, yeah. that you really started to see the scouts come to games, and, and that's really where they started picking up the players. So, like many many kids my age, that's where I was um, first really noticed. Yeah. So, do you remember your first day at United? Do you remember first day? Yeah. Well, what we used to do on yeah. a regular basis, we used to head up to um, the cliff and Littleton Road and we'd stay up at the, the Salford University Halls of Residence just up a little bit from Littleton Road a bit further up yeah. so it would have been school holidays um, half terms Easter's you know things like that coming up and um, and staying with all the, the kids from all over the country we used to get kids in from Ireland Northern Ireland Scotland etc um, and getting everybody together up there and really having a look at them um, in like little camps basically little little training camps we'd, we'd do and it was it was great fun you know it was fantastic to um, just to be we, we, at that stage you're not really mixing around the first thing you, you'd no. see them we, we stayed at Littleton Road you know at different times um, but we'd have games against um, the local teams as well so it was it was great it was absolutely great How old were you at that time? Probably 14 something like that 13, 14 when I first started um you know, travelling. I I was pretty lucky when I was a young, you know, at that age. I was sought after, so it would be, you know, Easter at United, half term at Arsenal, um, you know, Christmas at Villa or Blackburn or Leeds or somewhere else. And my mum and dad weren't weren't pushy at all, or they and then they're not they're, they're United fans. But my dad is anyway. Mum could take it or leave it, but they never. They never pushed me in one direction, and they always said, um, "Go and experience all these clubs, and you make the decision, John." Um, which was great, which was absolutely perfect. So I got to see, you know, lots and lots of clubs um, all over the country. Even went up to Rangers, which was which was a great experience as well. So, which club would have been your your first um, contact with the academy system, as we now call it? Stoke City. Stoke City ran a centre of excellence in Nuneaton, in a place called Arley. And um, I used to go up there every Friday night and train with um, um, Dick Bradshaw, um, God rest his soul, and Bernard Payton, who Bernard, last time, Bernard was, has, has been chief scout at lots of clubs. Um, he followed Steve Bruce around. So um, whether or not he's moving again, I don't know. But um Super guys, absolutely. You know, football people through and through, and they uh, they helped me an, an awful lot as a younger kid. Very different system to now, for for better or for worse. Uh, the United system of the late eighties and mid nineties had a obviously phenomenal reputation. What do you think, having been a part of it, made it so special? For attention to detail. Um, Fergie was all over it. He. He was, I think he made it clear right from the get-go that um, he was going to take a leading role in, in running the youth policy.
policy and, and helping people like Les Kershaw um, and the various scouts at the time um, to identify and, and offer the best product for um, the young players at the time. Um, it, it was the gaffer came to my house. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many um, managers, Premier League managers, would do that. Um, you know, came to my house and all, my, all the neighbours are outside looking at the gaffer's big Mercedes outside. You know, <laughs> it's 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 crazy. The 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 lengths and the efforts, the determination that the gaffer and all of his staff put in to attract and sign the best young talent around. Um, it, uh, hard work. <laughs> I think that that's some the determination and the hard work. Um, I think was probably the the differentiator between Manchester United and and many of the other clubs. Don't get me wrong, the other clubs worked hard, but I don't think they had the support that the manager at Manchester United gave to the youth policy. Um, I think they, if they had it, things would have been a little different. Um, but um, the gaffer really supported it and was and made sure he knew that it was a vital part of his armoury, um, you know, as well as the clubs. So they made it sounds like they made you feel a part of the club very early, and perhaps that gave you more of a zest to actually to go and play for them rather than being dumped aside or parked aside as a separate entity. Yeah, all football clubs do that. All football clubs are very nice to you when they want you. Um, it's when things go badly that you find out, you know, <laughs> the, the true nature of people. Um, but football's ruthless. So, you know, I've, I've been involved in it my whole life. There are there's very few um, friends in the game. True, true friends. Um, it is it is a ruthless system. And it has to be. Anything that is as competitive as professional football is, it is always going to be like that. Um, you know, so it's... Um, yes, they did. They did absolutely make you feel welcome, but they weren't alone in doing that. Um, I don't think that was a specific Manchester United thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the training at the time, um, how would you describe the, the style of the sessions? As, as a... Um, as a youngster, you know, 13, 14, 15, um, not, I, you know, I wouldn't say that the coaches that worked with us at, at that time were any different th than any other club. Um, it wasn't until I was an apprentice that I started started working with, um, let's, have a, let's have a think, that there is, you know, <laughs> Eric had a lot to do with, with what I did. Um, Neil... Neil Bailey as well, but I think I think differentiator. You think about Eric Harrison, and was he the best coach in the world? No. Um, did he know the game? Yes. Did he know what was required to be a Manchester United player? Absolutely yes. Um, but what Eric did, he didn't do. He didn't certainly didn't reinvent the wheel from a from a football perspective, from a tactical perspective, from a technical perspective, but psychologically. He prepared you for life as a professional footballer better than anybody I've ever met. Um, and people underestimate the psychological side of the game. It, it's absolutely huge. And um, he did a, an amazing job of preparing you for the competitiveness, the ruthlessness of professional sport. Um, I've never seen anyone better. I've been to a number of, of meetings and CPD events uh, recently and there does seem to be a slight shift um, away from the, the technical and physical side and everyone's going, yeah, you can have that, you can have that, but if you haven't got that psych corner, you're not going to get anywhere. And I think it's taken a long time finally realising that. Yeah, I think I think you, you look at recruitment, I think it's completely changed. When, when I was a kid... Um, they were, they were not solely, because you know, English football has always been physical, so they were always looking for the physical aspects. They were looking for the best technical players. And cert certainly recently, in recent times, when I say in the last you know, 10 years ago, they focused a lot on the technical side of the game. I think more recently, the last five years or so, clubs are recruiting athletes. 
because they know the systems, the development systems they have in place. And they're trying to develop athletes, sorry, they're trying to identify athletes at a very young age, um, which is tough to do. Um, but, but they know that if that young player is in their system for 10 years, they can actually turn that athlete into a footballer. Um, and yeah, the, the, the side now that you, you, that you rightly bring up is, it doesn't matter if they're technically gifted and they're an athlete, they have to have the mentality. They have to be a winner, and that's what um, Sir Alex certainly. You know, I've gone from Fergie, the gaffer, Sir Alex. <laughs> I don't know what to call him, um, and Eric did um, to a, to a massive extent. They did that so well um, because they knew the the rigors of, of the sport. And you know what? I don't know the methods that they employed. I don't know whether you could employ those same methods today without getting sacked, without getting health and safety all over you. The things that we did, you know, you know, that were character building. That's exactly what they were. They were to build mental strength, and if you couldn't hack it, you know, you were out the door. I was going to come to a question there, and I was just going to simply state, was it harsh? I'm trying to oh. up. The environment that they created at Manchester United um, that I'm, that I, listen, I haven't, I haven't been to Carrington for a long time. Um, I'm sure it exists today that as a young player or as a player, when you walk through the door of the training ground, the you were immediately on your toes. You had to be impeccable. <coughs> You'd sit downstairs. If if the gaffer or Eric had seen you with your feet on the on the chairs, for example you'd have been nailed. Um, it's If you were reading the newspaper, sat in the canteen reading the newspaper, you know, relaxing, you'd have been nailed. Um, because, you, you know, everything was about being a pro, getting there. If, you, if you've got to do your jobs, if you haven't done your jobs, you know, you're going you're gonna to get, you know, sorted out. If you've done your jobs, then you've got to help other people do their jobs. Um, so, even that in itself, that kind of, upbringing that we were fortunate to have you know it's got nothing to do with football my job was to clean the gym um but i knew that if i didn't wipe all the sweat off the exercise bike and the foreman came and seen it and i was reported to, to eric or you know that you god forbid the gaffer got involved you know life wouldn't be worth living so you very quickly learn that you had to be you know impeccable all the time um in every, in every sense, on and off the field. And that, that that's a tough job to do. That's a tough job to maintain those standards in a organisation as big as Manchester United. That's, that's, you know, you've got a lot of good people working with you to be able to do that who, who are, are you know, singing from the same hymn sheet or following orders to the letter. Once you were in at uh, 14 and 15, did you get much opportunity play outside of the United environment or was it very much channeled into the United setup? Well I, I went to the FA National School of Excellence. So at Lillishaw yeah. um, at fourteen. So I left home at fourteen to go there for two years. And in the first year I, I'd already been involved with United before I went there. Um, and United's advice was don't go. Phil Neville had been invited, you know, he's a couple of years older than me, and they advised him not to go. Um, and I think that's because United have a certain way of doing things, uh, and they do things differently. They were never that supportive of the England setup. Had I been Scottish, I think things that might have been differently. Um, but, um, so the, the only, once you were, once I'd signed, the only exposure I had of not Manchester United's methodology was playing for England. Um, and they're, they're very similar. They're very similar. When you're representing your country, you have to be, you have to uphold all the um, um, well, the qualities that, that Manchester United, you know, demand and some. Um, so the, the two were... You know, we're, we're very similar. Both setups, high standards, strict rules, much freedom. And I mean that both as a person and also in terms of playing style. 
Yeah, I, I, United, you were, you were certainly given enough rope to hang yourself. Um, and many did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you had freedom. It was, it was a decision that you made. You didn't have any freedom once you were inside the training ground. Outside the training ground, absolutely. Absolutely, you, you were your own person. Um, don't, you know, the gaffer had a network um, and the club had a network of people who would keep their eye on you. Um, but you, you could you could do whatever you wanted outside of the uh, of the training uh, and the game, you know, situations. Absolutely. At what stage in this whole process did you actually think I'm going to make it? I'm going to be a pro. Well, I signed pro on my 17th birthday, um, and I, I was born in September, so I'd only actually been through the door. You know, a couple of months, and I was a pro. And I think, looking back, there's there's differences in, you know, you can sign a professional contract, it doesn't make you a pro. You can play ten games, it doesn't make you a pro, so to speak. I suppose it, I suppose it does, but it doesn't make you, mean you're going to make a living out of the game. You know, I was lucky. I didn't retire until I was 33, um, and I and I had a, a made a good living out of the game. Um, when did I realise I was a pro? Uh, it probably wasn't at United. You know, it was probably at Blackburn or somewhere like that, or Barnsley. You know, in my early twenties, that you think, yeah, you know, you know, I can do this now, and I and I'm pretty, you know, maybe not at the Champions League, Premier League level, um, but I can. Uh, I'm a professional footballer, and I can stay in this for a long time. And it probably wasn't. It probably wasn't until I left United, really, that you start thinking like that. And then when you got into the first team at United, did training change? Was there a, a, a drastic difference between training for the reserves and training with Sir Alex and with his lieutenants? Well, Eric Harrison was his lieutenant, so you know there. there no, there wasn't. It wasn't until I left Manchester United. Having been brought up through the system at the highest level with England and, and, and United, it wasn't until you left there and went to Barnsley, who were on loan, who were at the time top of the championship, that you realised the difference. And it wasn't necessarily the, the, the actual playing. The, listen, don't get me wrong, training with the first team was unbelievable. It was intense, it was fast, it was super competitive and that's what the difference was going elsewhere it was that intensity at United you were pedal to the metal the whole time um, there was no room for any kind of slack in any sense at Barnsley or every club I have been at subsequently there, there, is, there was never that intensity never so, you know, that's, and I enjoyed that as a player. I, I actually, going to Barnsley was like a breath of fresh air. It was like, whew, relax now. Um, and that felt nice. Was it good professionally? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was good professionally. Um, you know, and if I had have been able to maintain that level of intensity um, that I'd experienced at Manchester United, maybe I'd have stayed in the in the Premier League longer. Maybe I would have had a better career. Um, but the fact that it was so much different, and you noticed that difference when you went to other clubs, um, was I you know what I'm saying? Maybe a credit to, to to the way things were done at Manchester United. That's interesting. I'm just thinking: is it possible? Is the other way? And in some, well, for some people, but what happened? And the style at United, they might have found it suffocating. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if you ask guys who haven't come through the system at United and weren't involved at United from a very, I didn't know any different. See that that's, you don't know any different. It's only when you left that you realise there was something different. But if you'd come, if you'd come the other way, so you interviewed Jonathan Greening, for example. You interviewed Jonathan Greening um, about the, what he felt. I know he came young. But when he arrived as a 19-year-old from York or wherever he was, Jono will tell you that it was a massive difference. Imagine coming from York, who were like League Two or whatever they were, and then coming into 
Manchester United, he wouldn't have known what the hell hit him. Mm. Um, and even and even you know more senior players. I think if even if you interviewed Teddy Sheringham and he spent his whole life at Forest, Millwall, Tottenham, and he comes to Manchester United, he would notice a difference big time um, into the way Manchester United operated and the level of intensity, the, the training sessions and the games and the environment at United in comparison to his other clubs. Even top clubs, you know, all, all decent. Millwall, maybe not, but <laughs> Forest and, and Tottenham at the time, you know, top clubs. Yeah. Chris, you've got a few questions now. Yeah, so... Um, go on, go on, yeah. so <coughs> do you want to quickly take us through your path into coaching before we go on to how you started in America? Well, as a, as a player, like many players do, um, I had no... If you'd have asked me as a 25-year-old, John, do you want to go into coaching? No. You know, I'd have said, no, I want to buy houses and be a property developer and do a bit of stockbroking and, and this and that. Um, day trading I used to used to do when, when, I, was, when I was younger. Yeah. Um, but it's only actually when you get to 28, 29, 30, and you actually think, well, hold on a minute, I've spent my entire life, I don't know, your entire life focused on one thing and one thing only, and, oh, by the way, now you get to the stage where you can never do that again. You can never do that again. Mm. Um, and the toughest thing about being a professional footballer is retirement and not being a professional footballer. So many lads go off the rails um, because they have been focused on one thing and all of a sudden they can't do that thing anymore. Um, I, I can't think of another parallel to that. The only, the only thing I could think of is if, you know, God forbid somebody got injured somehow and couldn't do their job. That's the only way I can see it because that's basically what it is. It's a physical disability, yeah. aging, that doesn't enable you to do your job. So when you got to that stage, it was like, oh, damn, I better start thinking about something in football. This is all I know. Yeah. Um, so I started doing my coaching badges um, with the PFA. I found I really enjoyed it, coaching the U12s at Notts County, um, and then graduated up to the U16s, enjoyed that, and I continued to coach towards the end of my career, and then went to Australia to play, and continued to coach there, um, finished in Australia, and then fell on a job coaching full-time in Italy, um, and, you know, I, I, I think I discovered that I was pretty good at it, you know, I've got all this knowledge and experience that I can pass on. Yeah, um, I, you know, and as a, I know you can tell me different. The people listening can tell you different. I was a good communicator, and I was able to get that message across to people in a way that the kids understood, and 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 I got satisfaction out of watching them take whatever they wanted from that from that new understanding that they had, that and the improvement that they made as a player um, directly from. My knowledge. That's, uh, any teacher will tell you that's hugely satisfying, and I, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. So you're currently working in the New York, the New York Club Soccer League. So could you quickly give us an overview of what it is and what your role is within the organisation? Sure. The New York, the, the landscape of youth soccer in America is very, very complicated, unnecessarily complicated. Um, but there is a, a branch of the youth game called US Club Soccer. It's a it's a an organisation that runs kind of like a, a large se- segment of US um, soccer, youth soccer, and um, one of their big leagues in the north, the New York Soccer League. I also work as their technical director. I also work directly with another big US club league in the northeast called the New England Premiership. Yeah, and in, in both of those leagues, I run development programs, um, player development programs, um, which are coaching programs for the very strongest players. They, they, they come underneath US Club Soccer's banner, um, but the leagues need someone to run them, um, and I run them on, on behalf of the leagues and, and US Club Soccer. So it, I'm lucky in that I get to... It's like having the old pick of the league team. So uh, when I played, I, I played in the Tamworth League in, um, in the Midlands there, and we'd have a pick of the league team and the pick of the league team would then go and play against other pick of the league teams from other leagues in the area. That's a bit like what we do here. 
the yeah. difference being my pick of the league team is um, twelve hundred teams and three states and <laughs> you know twenty five million people. So it's a massive. It's not the Tamworth League, you know, with eight teams. Or it's it's a big, big because the US is so vast. So it means luckily that I get to work with some some good players, and the, the standards the standard of of the kids over here is getting better. I know it is everywhere, but the, the kids are getting getting better over here faster. I think they're catching up to an extent. It's going to take listen. It'll take decades. And it'll take a cultural shift in the US before they're anywhere near like they are back in Europe. But there's there's significant improvement. Yeah, I remember from our previous conversation, you said the mentality of winning in America is obscene compared to over in Europe, and it's something we need. They need to change to help with the development of younger players. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, that, that, there's a there's a propensity to think winning mean is a good thing. Yeah. Winning in in youth football can mean more often than not means you're taking shortcuts and you can't take shortcuts to develop players. Um, so I think there's a lack of understanding, a huge lack of understanding in that you know kicking the ball over the top for the big kid to run on and score. Many short-sighted people see that as a big, uh, you know, as as the greatest thing. In reality, anybody who knows the game, anybody who has knows anything about developing players, knows that that you have to take time and you have to have a thorough, thorough development program. Um, you know, touching all the all the areas of, of of development to be able to make professional players develop professional players. And don't forget, you're not developing professional players here in the US. You're developing 16 year olds. Who are going to get a college scholarship? So that there's very few people who have actually developed players right away to the pro level. It's it's beginning. Thankfully, it's beginning now. And there's there's um, there's rules in place where kids can dip their toe into the college game and come out of it immediately um, before they become damaged goods and go and play in the MLS and and go and play in the USL um, for you know second string teams of MLS clubs. And it's doing them so much, so much more good than spending four years in college. You know, these guys, you, you think about the Clint Dempsey's of the world who spent four years in college and still were a pro. Mm. That is an amazing achievement to be able to do that, by the way. You know, if I'd, if I'd have spent four years in college, there's no way I'd have been a pro um, of, at any level. That's how detrimental the college game is to developing players. Do you want to say something, Peter? Well, I was just thinking. Well, speaking of rules in place, I, I, I've not asked anyone from the states this, or work, it works in the states this, but I've seen and heard about the no heading rule. Um, can you elaborate on that and what you think about it? <laughs> it, it that, that's, that's no, no, no. Listen, I'm, I'm free to, to to talk. That comes about from. A parent, I believe, and listen, uh, I might paraphrase and I might have got the facts slightly wrong here, but there was um, a, a player out west who um, suffered badly from concussions. Um, his parent was, must have been a very powerful, wealthy guy um, or lady who thought he or she would do something about this and... Um, started a court case against um, the USSF and its affiliates of which US club, US youth soccer, um, all these different, say soccer, AYS, all these different organizations that fit underneath <coughs> US soccer on the youth side. Um, and rather than, rather than have this court case and have all the issues with this court case, the federation, and, and that could have been a nightmare, for them, an absolute nightmare for them. Instead of going through with all that, the Federation said, yeah, absolutely, we'll bring in these protocols um, and we will limit heading for the younger kids. And that's what they did. And, and, and they were forced to do that by to a, to a certain extent. Um, so it's not you know, anyone back in Europe who's thinking or anywhere else is thinking, oh, that's typical of the US, what they're thinking, trying to change the rules of our game, which is what I would have thought of. You know, ten years ago, 
Um, it's not that. They, these guys were forced to do that with the threat of litigation hanging over them. Um, it's that, that coaches can't um, practice heading below the age of 11 um, and from U11 down in games heading is banned. So, um, and there are all kinds of concussion protocols in place that clubs or organisations must have dealing with the effects of concussions. Um, and this, this again, it stems from this player, but I think it stems also a lot from American football and the issues they had had um, with, uh, with, with concussions. But it's a different... I don't think I've ever seen anybody who has got a concussion from heading the football. Uh, sure, class of heads, kicked in the head... Um, yes, absolutely. Um, but I don't think it's got anything to do with actually heading the ball. Not the balls um, these days. You think the ball's in the, exactly. in the 60s. And and yeah. I think a better a better argument that they could have made is, you know, speaking to the ball manufacturers and making the size 4 ball you know, an ounce lighter or whatever, um, rather than trying to ban heading. And it's, it has caused an absolute nightmare. There's, there's lots of new initiatives that the Federation have brought out recently. Um, and of course, you know, what do the coaches over here do? What do the parent coaches, the, all the terrible coaches over here in the US do? They encourage their kids to kick the ball long, um, knowing full well that the kids can't hit it. They're taking long corners into the box because they can score. So rather than use this as an advantage to play below head high and and, and play attractive football that's going to aid development, playing through the thirds, playing short corners, etc., etc. Um, they are now doing the complete opposite and you know sticking to type and trying to take advantage of the fact that little Johnny U9 can't head it and kicking it as high in the air as you possibly can. Deal with that one. So it's 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 crazy. It's, it's crazy, but it's it's the market that we're in. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, <coughs> so, so we discussed in the last time the difference between European academy system and the American is that Americans have to pay for their to learn how to play. For the most part, yeah, it's a pay to play system in the US for the vast majority of the players. Yeah. So, so the coaching methods are completely different because they can complain. That was the. Yes. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> if you're paying for something, you have the yeah, right to complain. Yeah, so, there's a lot of good things that the Federation are trying to do. The highest level of youth soccer in the US is called the Development Academy. Yeah. And one of the aims of the Development Academy is to reduce the cost for the players. So um, I, I may be wrong here, but of the MLS development, the MLS clubs who have development academies, which I think is virtually all, um, virtually all are free to the users. So in New York, New York's You've got New York City FC, you've got the Red Bulls. Yeah. Okay. Two, uh, two MLS franchises, both of which are free. So any kid from, you know, who's involved at the highest level with the Red Bulls or the New York City FC doesn't pay. The, the, whatever programs they offer are free. And, and you take New York City FC, they're extensive now. Um, so they're training three, four times a week, traveling to um, tournaments, traveling back to the UK to City. Um, all over the place. It, it is the, the the MLS clubs are doing things exactly the same as the um, the professional clubs back home. They, they, there might be slight differences. That they do have one or two of the MLS clubs now have um, residential programs, and so they get you know even more contact time than, than our coaches would back in the back in England. Um, but for the most part, they're they're doing the right thing. It's the level. It's the level below that where you could argue a lot of professional football. It's particularly over in the US because the holes in the net in the US are huge. So there are lots of players that have the potential to be um, professional players who slip the net at the development academy level and then don't get a chance. And that's really what. What I do, I try and catch those kids who have missed that development academy, those late developers, um, or those kids not identified to, to be involved with the development academy. And I try to help those kids and provide a secondary pathway for them into into the, the top level. Is it still a huge problem that you lose good players around 
thirteen, fourteen to the other major American sports, or do players tend to stick with soccer these days? Or? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think if anything, it might be the other way. I haven't heard of many of the kids that I coach leaving the game. Um, I think it's probably more prevalent the other way around, mm. um, which which is great, you know. But, People are starting to realise how good football is, to be honest, and uh, and how good a game it is to play. You think in in America, you've got baseball. You know, listen, I'm a big cricket fan, so I won't say it's boring, but you say it's limited on excitement um, for the narrow-minded. I'll say um, you've got American football, where realistically you've got to have so much equipment to play properly. So many of you, half the time you stood on the sideline, uh, um, it might be a good game to watch on telly. But I can't see it being a good game to play. Never played it. You can throw it around to each other, but that's about it. Um, ice hockey, which is ridiculously expensive to play. Mm. Um, basketball is the only one, really, that is the equivalent that has the, the ease. You know, everywhere in New York City, there's basketball courts. Um, if we could put little football, little five side football pitches all over the place, it would be great. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a drive to, to do that, which is which would be amazing because it's you know it's two jumpers for goalposts. You just need yeah. a ball and two guys, and you and you're there. Um, so basketball has that similarity because there's so many you know um, basketball hoops around the place. So I just walked footsteps straight away there. By the way, yeah. Um, I mean, multi-use games areas are. are, are prevalent now in this country it, you won't get somewhere that's just got goals It's there'll be a goal with a hoop above it and yeah. you just put that there chuck a futsal in you've got a whole heap of players ready to go and it's not massively it's not going to take a huge chunk out of someone's budget to change those areas yeah no you're right Yeah, you, you play futsal on the basketball courts no problem at all and, and listen they do you know they're um Futsal in New York, for example, is is very popular with the um, less wealthy kids, so to speak. And I know that's being politically correct, but the, the the poorer kids are playing. They're out there, especially the Hispanic lads and, and girls. Um, they love to play. They're playing all over the place. So it's just that in the US, the football has a reputation of being a bit like rugby or cricket back home. It it's the rich man's sport. It's more well-to-do sport, um, and I think that's more so on the girls' side. And there's been a lot of a lot of stuff in the news about the national team not representing the U.S. and and, and you know the vast majority of the youth national teams are blonde-haired girls with ponytails um, from well-to-do backgrounds, um, rather than you know the, the Hispanic girls from Southern California or wherever, um, who, who we all know are, are fantastic. So it's it's tough to it's tough for those those kids because the game is expensive. It is, you know, a typical club in New York, you know, a, a good level club at, at the level I'm working at, he's probably charging two grand minimum. Um, and there's clubs that are charging more than that, you know, closer to three. Uh, and that doesn't include all the expenses that you've got. If you're playing um, for, a, I don't know, an ECNL club, in New York, you probably paying your, your fees of three grand. Then you're traveling every other weekend, hotel fees, tournaments, flights. It, you know, you, know you, you sound stupid, but you're probably not far short ten grand a year to to have your daughter play. Which is, as a person who never spent a penny, maybe my mum had to go to Tesco and buy a load of oranges twice a year because it was our turn to supply the half-time oranges. That was it. That was the limit of the costs. Yeah. Um, Buy some boots and do that. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's crazy, really. So, so these talented Hispanic, or well, could be from somewhere of a different background, um, players <laughs> yeah. have in, in some ways actually got more chance of making it at the pro level than they have at the grassroots level because it costs less. Yes, but the problem is 
to get, and this is where New York City FC are doing a good thing. They're trying to link with the community. They're, they're trying to form relationships with clubs to identify those players early. They want access to those players because they realise that. They realise the gene pool in the, and the mentality, comes back to that again, the mentality of the players who are from less privileged backgrounds lends itself more to making it as a player making it as a professional player, that grit, that determination, that resilience that you need to be a professional athlete is is more prevalent with the underprivileged in the underprivileged communities. And they're doing a job to try and identify those players early um, and offering programs for free. So they know that, listen, the, the, they know exactly what's going on, the people in the US, the people at the highest levels, the federation, the people who run the development academy, they know all of this. It's just trying to get a, get around it. Um, and they are doing it slowly, but it's to, to change any culture um, is going to take an awful lot of time. And listen, in America, you pay for everything. Absolutely everything. It is, um, you don't get anything for free. Um, and that that's a very different culture to, to, to one we've got in the UK. Um, so, and, and to shift that culture is going to take time. Yeah, I've spoken to people about this, this um, the contrast, because here, if someone says at grassroots, by the way, it's going to cost you 300 quid a season, they go, nah, see you later. <laughs> but compared to, as you just said, what happens in America, if it was £300 for the season, fantastic, bargain. And it's a, it's a stark contrast, and it's just from the expectations that people have and what they're used to. Here, in England, it's, we don't pay for our grassroots football. What are you talking about? But in America, because as you said, pay for everything. Like, yeah, sure, have it, have it. Have well, it. think of it like this and think a little bit deeper. Everybody involved in football, virtually everybody involved in football in the US, is paid... That, that, that's not so that's a big statement but the people who are in powerful positions <coughs> with the US youth football are paid to be in those positions so the decision makers are happy for the status quo because they're getting paid because of it and that's the, that's going to take the biggest shift people need to make some really big and hard decisions and unselfish decisions for the betterment of the game in this country and that is a very big ask that is a very very big ask for people to do um so you, you take us club soccer you take us youth soccer AYS, whatever it may be um people are getting paid um, and you know they're relying on the game for their income um you know listen i'm one of them i'm technical director of a league i, I do this full time um I am paid somewhat by the programs that I run and somewhat by the clubs within our league who pay for involvement within our league. Um, if we as a league said we're going to run this program for free, then there's five or six people, five or six people who are involved with the league who don't get paid anymore. You know, well that's fine if I can go to Walmart and say, right, here's my shopping, and you give it me for free because I'm doing this for free. It's you know it's just it's very tough and that's the bigger issue I think that, that we've got to try and get to. You look at the you look at home. Everybody wants to work in an academy, right? So brilliant. You can go and work in an academy, but you're only going to make thirty grand a year working in an academy. Twenty five, thirty grand. If some of these full time roles in a category one academy back home at a Premier League club are paying absolute buttons because they know there are lots of qualified people out there who would give their right arm to work with, I don't know, Chelsea youngsters, Arsenal youngsters, whoever. Um, so they, they, the clubs can pay buttons. Uh, um, so it's it's the same on the opposite way around, kind of, back in the UK. Interesting. Same reasons. Yeah. It is, it is. Uh, and it's very interesting to think of a system where grassroots operates on elite money and elite operates on grassroots money. Yeah. Very, it's, it's, as we're talking about. Ash Calvary has sent in a listener's question. So, um, how do you feel the quality of US youngsters compared to the youngsters you came through the youth ranks with? At the younger age group, 
So from U8, U9, U10, yeah. maybe even U11, they compare very well. Um, as soon as you start going older than that, the, the there's a huge drop off. Mm. Um, if I took a, I took a a what was it, 2006 kid born in 2006 to um, City, Everton, Wolves, um, a few a few months back, and he compared very well. You know, they won a couple of clubs wanted to sign him, um, but if, if I waited and took him again when he's 15, the chances of them, he would have fallen so far behind. If he stays in the same place, he would have fallen so far behind our kids um, that he, he would stand no chance. Now, and part of that is the coaching. Part of that is there aren't enough people in the US who understand the game. And when I mean the game, I mean the 11 v 11 game. Yeah. Um, and it's not until they get to U13 over here, so 2004 this season, that they're actually playing 11 v 11. So up to that point, it's mostly, it's, it's, it's kind of less about the coach and more about the kids, you know, having fun and, and individual stuff. You think of a, the, the development of a younger player. As a four-year-old, you can't think about anything else other than yourself. And, and that kind of mentality changes as you grow. And as soon as you have to start thinking about other people, and there isn't the coaching to be able to give them the right advice. Um, and I think that's a big issue. So that there's a huge drop-off at those age groups. Right, so before we finish, do you want to plug your social media? So your Twitter? And... Me? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. J Curtis Soccer is uh, is my handle on um, on Twitter. I'm, I'm pretty active on there. If anyone wants to follow, I try and I try and retweet interesting stuff with people that I follow and and, and give as much information as I I possibly can about what's going on in the in the US. Um, but it's uh, you know I, I, I enjoy Twitter. It's it's good. I I, I love getting into to dialogue with people. I like the way that you can do that, you know, complete strangers, you can have conversations and arguments and yeah. whatever <laughs> differences of opinion. Is that it makes for uh, it makes for a lot of fun. The wife complains a lot when I'm doing it in the middle of the night, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, but but I enjoy it absolutely. Yeah, and I'm gonna have, I still have all the links from the last interview, so I'll, I'll put them all in the description below this interview. So, so but I'm Fantastic. sure we could have gone for another hour, but it's only meant to be a half hour show. <laughs> so. Right. So I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. I'm sure Peter has as well. And I'll, again, I'd love to have you on again in the future. So. Yeah, no problem, guys. Listen, it's uh, this is a pretty good time of year for me. It's uh, you know this time of the day as well works works pretty well. I'm not coaching tonight, so night off. Thanks, John. Uh, I enjoyed that, and uh, maybe next time dig a bit more into the coaching side. Yeah, absolutely. Happy. Listen, happy if you want some content. Happy to help, guys. When will you have it? Um, when will you have it done by? Um, if it's not, I could have it out tonight. I I'm planning to have it out tonight. If it's not too much editing, so um... you're not getting this one under half an hour, mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, talk too much. That's all right. That's not... <laughs> it's usually me. I, I, I just, we just won't put the bit our bit in at the beginning. Oh, we can use that for the next show. <laughs> so... All right, guys. Well, listen, I've got to crack on with some work. I will. I'll leave it to it. You know where I am. If you want to chat about anything, I'm happy to happy to help. Brilliant. Thank you. All right. I say. I'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.